Welcome to the CNBC Africa debate coming to you live from the World Economic Forum on Africa, currently in session in Cape Town. Our focus for the next hour is agriculture, investing in transformation. And in this session, we focus on how partnerships across the African continent are accelerating investment in this vital sector of the economy. Joining me from my immediate right, I have Akin Adesina, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in Nigeria, Philip Carrero, the President and Chairman of the Eastern African Farmers Federation, Kenya, Jane Karuku, who is President of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, or AGRA, Michael Mack, the CEO of Syngenta International, and James Mwangi, the Group CEO of Equity Bank Kenya. We'll be accepting audience questions throughout today's discussion via Twitter. Our hashtag is hashtag with agriculture. Now, the World Bank expects Africa's farmers and agribusinesses to become a trillion dollar food market by 2030 by expanding access to more capital, electricity, better technology, and irrigated land. But this will require governance, governments to work side by side with agribusinesses to link farmers with consumers in an increasingly urbanized Africa. African agriculture, traditionally seen as subsistence, is being recognized as a powerful driver of the continent's growth. And despite covering a surface area of roughly 30 million square kilometers, with 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land, Africa is still footing a food input bill of $50 billion annually. We moved from a self-sufficient production system uh, to a net importing situation uh, to the extent that now we were importing and spending $11 billion importing basic things like wheat, rice, sugar and fish. It doesn't make any sense given our potential. Agriculture accounts for more than one-third of sub-Saharan Africa's economic output and the food market is valued at 310 billion US dollars and has the potential to grow to 1 trillion US dollars by 2030, according to the World Bank. A major turnaround also is in moving at looking at it just as a social, mm -hmm. uh, social sector and really more as an economic sector and looking at farmers not just as people who need to be helped but as agribusinesses and, and economic, potential economic powerhouses in their own right. There have been a contribution of factors that has led to Africa's lackluster food production. These include issues around property rights, land grabbing and a lack of investment in modern technology. It's all good to provide uh, people with land, but they also have to have the capacity to cultivate and manage the land that they have. And that's why they need training and infrastructure for transport, water, machinery, etc. They need to know how to handle seeds, they need, how to need to know how to transport their yields, and they also need how to know how to store uh, their yields. So this all comes back to education. By 2030, Africa will have one of the youngest populations in the world. And according to a study by the Population Reference Bureau, this demographic will be the driving force behind the continent's economic prosperity. The key challenge going forward, though, will be how we can get young people interested in agriculture, simply because they are the majority. And, uh, and this is where I think much more needs to be done. 2030 is the target for Africa to become a net food exporter and agriculture to become a trillion dollar industry. And for this vision to be realized, it will require a unified effort to create the conditions in which African farmers can flourish. Well, Minister Adesino, we may be in search of a $1 trillion business in Africa when it comes to agriculture, but you have been quoted as saying that you want agriculture to be bigger than oil in Nigeria. That's quite a big statement for an oil-based economy. Is it a reality? Absolutely. You know, take a look at it. Nobody drinks oil and nobody smokes gas. You know, it, agriculture is going to be the lifeline for, for Africa. And why not? Take a look at Nigeria, for example. We have 84 million hectares of land, of which no more than 60% of it is cultivated. And in fact, in terms of optimal cultivation, no more than 10% of it is in high quality seed, fertilizers, mechanization, and good irrigation. But the key in terms of transforming agriculture in Africa for me is that we have to make a fundamental paradigm shift. 
Agriculture is not a social sector. Agriculture is not a development activity. Agriculture is a business. Whether you're in seed and fertilizer, processing, value adding, transport, logistics, everything about agriculture is a business. That, for me, is fundamental. Secondly, we must understand that the role of government in agriculture is not to produce anything. The role of government is to provide enabling environment, right policies, institutions to support private sector, good regulations and infrastructure support for the private sector to drive the system. Agriculture in Africa must shift into that kind of a thing. For me in Nigeria, we have focused on making our agriculture more productive, efficient, competitive. We want to be a global player with the kind of water we have cheap labor we have to intensify agriculture. It makes absolutely no sense to me that we are a large importer of food and we want to industrialize agriculture and make it to be a major revenue earner for us. And so some of the things that I think are very fundamental, there must be some major reforms. You know, major reforms to get a private sector in, in seed, in fertilizers, in tractors, in irrigation, privatizing, a lot of things. Those are very, very important. When I became minister in Nigeria, uh, I inherited a system of fertilizer supply that was probably the most corrupt system that you found in Nigeria. Government bought and sold fertilizers, and the fertilizer was half sand and half fertilizer. You know. And so what we did was it took us 90 days. Minister, I'm going to interrupt you there. I'm going to come to the enabling environment that you've created in Nigeria because I want to focus on it in more detail a little further down in the discussion. Okay. But I want to bring Philip in now in terms of a voice for East African farmers. Philip, the minister has said that agriculture should be seen as a business. Is that how the East African community is seeing agriculture right now? Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to report that uh, the East African community actually sees agriculture as, uh, as a business. It also sees uh, agriculture as, as, as a means to regional integration. Because if we can actually be food secure as a region, we should actually be able to actually uh, integrate our people and businesses. So I'm glad within the region that is the understanding, and also within the farm organizations, because all our activities as professional farm organizations are geared towards economic services to agriculture, so that our small scale farmers can actually get to transforming their businesses and getting to agriculture as a business. Jane, Agra committed to doubling the income of 20 million farmers by 2020. Ambitious goal, are you on track? Yes, yes, it is very ambitious and it is doable and we are on our way there. And I think we do this, I just, I'll take a bit of time to explain how we do it. We are doing it by intervening across the entire value chain, right from the seed to the table. Because we know the challenging, uh, our target is to work with smallholder farmers and they have a lot of structural challenges to be competitive so that they can see themselves as a business like Philip is describing them to be. So we, uh, we do attack uh, capacity building right from technology basis. So we, we've taken about 800 scientists across Africa in the 16 countries that we work in who work back, come back to Africa and work in research so that they can develop through biotechnology good varieties that can withstand the changing climate, that can improve productivity and can deliver to the farmer household, both for eating, for consumption and for selling the excess so they can do the other things that they need to do in life. Yeah. Michael, Minister Adesino a moment ago talking about creating that enabling environment. We are going to drill down into how he's doing that specifically in Nigeria. But as the private sector representative, what are you looking for? Well, look, uh, I mean, Africa today is a very large agricultural economy uh, in and of its own right. Uh, today, there's more land under cultivation in Africa uh, than all of China and all of India. And often we think about powerhouse agricultural economies like Russia and Brazil and there is more land under cultivation in all of Africa than Russia and Brazil combined. So when you think about the uh, productivity, though, of the African continent, it's not very high. So for us, we see this as a growth imperative. This is really going to be an agricultural powerhouse. It's just a question of when. And James, of course, finance is key to this equation. Many people must be knocking on your door. How are you meeting the needs of farmers out there? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, financing of agriculture is becoming more interesting. We are seeing governments invest substantially in creating the infrastructure to support this sector. We are seeing a change of mind where uh, development institutions are seeing now agriculture as a business as opposed to a philanthropic uh, development or social uh, sector. And again, we are seeing enormous uh, 
infusion of capacity building, particularly through partnerships. People like Agra, governments like Nigeria, and a lot of resources are being devoted to raise the capacity of the farmers. And consequently, they become bankable and their businesses become bankable. So it becomes pretty easy, and we are seeing huge flows in that sector. Mr. Adesina, coming back to this enabling environment and certainly weeding out corruption, you were mentioning seed and fertilizer where you have managed to make this possible. How have you done that? I think that's what happens is that, you know, in Nigeria, as with most African countries, government was buying and selling fertilizers and seed. And as you do that, the government essentially crowds out the private sector. And so the value chain, I mean, the, the supply chains of the seed companies and the fertilizer companies essentially get truncated and goes only to the government warehouse. And when that happens, uh, in the case of Nigeria, we were finding that fertilizer, as I was saying earlier, was half sand and, and half fertilizer. People will buy seed of the grain of the main market and sell it as seed. And so basically the farmers were being shortchanged. Uh, we were not really subsidizing farmers. Uh, you know, for those four decades, we were subsidizing corruption. And so when I became minister, the president was very clear that we had to clean up the system. And it took us essentially 90 days to clean it up. We took the government out of buying and selling. We privatized it. We put it all back in the hands of private sector. And today, in one year after doing it, the private sector seed companies in Nigeria sold $100 million worth of, uh, pri uh, of, of fertilizers directly to farmers as opposed to government. The seed companies sold $10 million worth of seed to farmers instead of to government. And, and that's a huge thing for us. And the other thing that we did was we developed this system called electronic wallet. You know, in Nigeria today, we have 150 million plus cell phones. We have more cell phones than you have of televisions in Nigeria. And so we took the power of that cell phone and we registered our farmers. Today we have registered 10 million farmers, all with full biometric information, and we send electronic coupons for seed and fertilizers to them by mobile phones. In our first year, we reached 1.5 million of them, and that impacted 7.5 million people. This year, we are going to reach 10 million of them by phone. So we've taken a, a sector that was a murky sector, corrupt sector, and we've opened it up. Today, I can tell you as a minister, which farmer gets what, when did they get it, where did they get it, how much did they pay, how much did we pay. And so that is the role of government. And I say my job is farmer's minister. I don't need anybody between me and farmers. And technology of cutting out the rent seekers is the fastest way to do it. The minister refers to... The minister refers to electronic wallet. iCow apparently is prevalent in Kenya and it can tell you when a cow is on heat, what you need to feed the cow in order to produce more milk. So certainly we've got uh, technology transformation, transforming the agricultural landscape. Are you seeing your farmers embracing technology? Yeah, in fact, we're actually seeing our farmers embracing technology. Uh, uh, with capacity, because even within our own organizations, we have actually ensured that uh, we, we, are, we actually strengthen our knowledge management and communication systems so that we can actually be able to actually connect farmers with existing innovations in communications and be able to do business. Because if they are actually properly connected and informed and they actually know exactly what to do with the technology that is actually available through innovative platforms, they should actually be able to, to get into business. But I have a feeling that all that we're actually doing is trying to ensure that uh, the environment is right. But we have a feeling that uh, there are things, there are basics that needs to be right before farmers can actually be confident and, uh, and be able to take advantage of the existing innovations and technologies. And one that is required for small-scale farmers is organization. Because if you look at the innovations and the service providers, they will not be able to service small-scale farmers properly unless they're organized. The banks, you know, the, the extension, uh, research, you, you know, name it. They will not be able to do a good job unless the farmers are actually properly uh, organized. Because you take, if you take the character of agriculture in Africa, 70% of it is actually small scale. And we need to actually find innovative ways of actually servicing that category of farming that is actually dominant in our own countries. So organization for us is actually key. And with organization, as you said, those different innovations that actually exist out there. And for Kenya, I think we are blessed in that uh, we, have, we have those next door. Uh, the farmers will actually be able to take advantage of Jane, you also are passionate about organized farmers and, and cooperation in terms of meeting investors' needs on a, a larger scale. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, I think uh, 
We have very many examples where we are seeing successful groups of farmers come together and they link up to even supplying larger multinationals. We have examples with, in South Sudan where cassava and Mozambique and Ghana where cassava grow growers are coming together and they've actually become a key supplier of cassava as a source of uh, starch to make brew, uh, beer for Southern Africa breweries and I understand that it tastes better, much better than the Bali one. A lot of people may not agree. And then this, uh, because a small farmer inherently is small and they have no voice and they are uncompetitive. So farmer groups are a very good platform for them to come together so they can build their scale and they can have negotiating power either for buying their own inputs or for selling their own produce. And I think the challenge there then, how do you build their capacity so they start thinking and they run themselves like a business. And we have good examples in, in Kenya, in Malawi, in West Africa, Fasojigi, uh, Davids, and uh, Tanzania as well. And I think it's a way of life. But the challenge and where we find a gap, and this is where probably governments can play a role, is that how do you create an enabling environment for either capacity building or for the laws and, uh, and then the platforms where these farmers come, to come together and in a way that we don't see them as competing with the political uh, the political powers that are, because that has been a challenge in the past. Michael, I just mm. want to stay on technology for a moment and how you balance technological innovation with employment, because traditionally farming has been used as an empowerment tool. Well, look, the, uh, first of all, technology is perfectly compatible with smallholder farmers. So many people think about it as uh, when you bring technology in, uh, labor can move off the land. It's been noted many times uh, that uh, you know, hand weeding isn't exactly a very, uh, agreeable, uh, a very agreeable job on a farm. Uh, farmers that are technologically enabled are able to put their kids in school and with more prosperity, of course, uh, success does breed success. I agree with Philip that uh, African farmers are themselves very willing and able to use the most modern technology that's available. What we need to have more of our markets for them to sell their production to. And uh, as Jane said, the best way to make those markets and thereby uh, be able to farm with confidence is to be able to link things up end to end. Technology enablement actually is a really easy part of the puzzle if we can uh, be sure that uh, that technology can find its way all the way to the consumer. That's happening. James, uh, coming back to the financial side of things, I was in a session this morning with eight ministers of agriculture that uh, formed Grow Africa some two years ago, I think, at this very forum. And those ministers, one of them suggested that there's a need for an agricultural bank. Is that the reality? Do we need a, a specialized bank to deal with farmers only? Uh, there are merits and demerits, uh, pros and cons of thinking that way. One, uh, while uh, people talk about the specialization, the problem is the size of the market, whether you want to create sector banks and how you insulate them from the shocks. Uh, when the shocks come. It is diversification that provides financial systems uh, with the resilience uh, that is built. However, there is a case uh, for really focused uh, product development tailored towards agriculture. Uh, there is also a case for looking at delivery mechanism towards agriculture. But you can't say that it would be a preserve of uh, an agricultural bank. So uh, to me, I would like Lille to take agriculture like any other sector. Otherwise, then we shall build a case uh, for manufacturing banks, brewing banks, you know, sort of mindset. So why don't we make agriculture a competitive industry that competes with the other sectors? And that is when you have a win-win situation, uh, both to the redder and to the borrower. But narrowing it and saying, let's have a bank that specializes, the, the inclination will be that these banks will offer low interest rates, then that ceases to be scalable and sustainable. So I would really, really advocate for the thinking uh, to really improve the sector itself. Not think about uh, enclaves that serves it, but think of improving the sector to be competitive and become a market player as a business. 
James, as a farmer's daughter, I feel well qualified to ask you this question. Is it not riskier to lend to a farmer because of events, shocks that you refer to? Floods, droughts, disease. Okay. I can name a couple more. Jenny, thank you very much. We seem to share a lot. I'm also a son of uh, a peasant uh, uh, of family. But I think the issue is not uh, the credit risk in agriculture. What we really need to address are the other risks that make agricultural lending difficult. What Lille Bank's fear is not analyzing and pricing credit risk. It's a question of the weather risk, the, uh, the market risk, the uh, disease risk, is the value chain risk, is the ecosystem risk. That is what banks are not uh, tailored to make. But banks would really address the credit risk. But uh, banks have a challenge of dealing with productivity, yield in the sector, weather hazards, dependability on uh, rain-fed agriculture. Those are the risks that a bank is not able to do. And that is why banks shy from, but they don't shy from the credit risk. Minister, I can see you want to add. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the, the thing is about all these development banks. I don't, I don't buy that for agriculture. If you look at Africa today, you have excess liquidity on the balance sheet of Africa's banks. We have big banks and they have deep pockets. The fact is less than 2% of all of that is actually going into agriculture, which accounts for over 40% of the GDP and 70% of employment. The question to ask is why? First and foremost is that a lot of bankers, you know, uh, uh, have very high passive risk of lending to agriculture, which is actually much excessively higher than the real risk of lending to agriculture. Secondly, is that banks themselves have not built that capacity to actually assess the risk of lending to agriculture. Today in Africa, the thing we need to do is to put in place risk sharing instruments that allows the risk that the banks face when they lend to agriculture to be much reduced. And in fact, we, we've done that. I mean, we started this when I was at Rockefeller Foundation, later when I was in Agra and now in Nigeria. We have, and also working with great bankers like, uh, 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 like James Mwangi, we put in place risk sharing instruments that are leveraging today tens of millions of dollars. In fact, in Nigeria, we put a place in place with the Central Bank of Nigeria a facility of $350 million that is leveraging $3.5 billion off the balance sheet of our banks. And so I think we need to change our mindset. The money is there. It's just making sure that we fix the financial value chain but also make sure, as James rightly said, that we fix also the agricultural value chain so that the whole thing is coordinated. If, a bank, if banks can find a money trail in anything, the banks will lend to it. And so that's why I come back to what I said earlier, that treating agriculture as a business, making investment cases there for banks. We've seen that in Nigeria. In last one year, the banks lent $20 million to seed companies in Nigeria. Zero percent default. And I think in your bank, you're experiencing about maybe about 2% default. So that's what we need to scale up. Michael? You know, let's not forget, by the way, that in many parts of the world, some of the risks that you just talked about were on account of Mother Nature, and there is an insurance industry out there. Uh, we were part of uh, setting up an insurance program that today covers more than 1,000 growers in Kenya and Uganda where we've set up weather stations and they pay a, an insurance when they buy their seeds and their crop protection chemicals and if the weather isn't agreeable, then they're instantly paid back and they don't have to haggle with the insurance companies. It's an example of credit and insurance at the same time for growers and, uh, and it's hassle-free and it's enabled by technology. And so there's plenty of innovation that can help these growers overcome some of the systematic risks of farming. Jenna, I see this topic is, is touching a nerve with everybody because James also wants to add, but if yeah. you can take the floor. No, I was going to say that we all need to work together on this agenda. And I think that James has a point. We need to de-risk the whole chain. Yes. So, for example, we need to start with a good seed that, you know, is going to improve maybe by a factor of 30 to even 100 percent in terms of your productivity. The knowledge. How, what do you do with that seed? How do you protect yourself from even if you're depending on the rain fed? How, how do you protect yourself against that? How do you take insurance over that? And those insurance products are not readily available in our part of the world. And then how do you market? I can see somebody tweeting that brokers are evil. Brokers are actually not evil because they actually link between the farmers and the markets. If you think, let's say, of uh, consumable products or fast moving, let's say like vegetables or, or fruits. And then the other part is that how do you make this market sustainable? So to the farmer who 
was farming and wanted to take it as a business, there is true value return to them. And if I could quickly share, there is a fantastic example out of, uh, of uh, Kenya where every partner has come together and it's about bananas. There is tissue culture and Rockefeller were gracious enough to fund that work. So the tissue culture gives you an uplift maybe of about 15 to 30 percent productivity. The value, somebody went and um, agra and taught these farmers instead of selling by eyeball way and then you improve your productivity or from a value perspective 13 times from one bob to 13 shillings a kilo the market is organized so you have one broker the market is ready the habit of eating bananas grow and james james's bank was able to come and lend these guys because they were de-risked in a way so you find the whole chain it keeps improving now this group of farmers are now trying to build more professional ripening systems so they can export ready-made bananas or even value-added in terms of chips and juices and stuff like that. So you risk the whole process, but work as partners from government, private sector, financial institutions, technology providers, etc. But we have to work together. So it's really about engaging this multi-stakeholder environment. We're going to discuss that further after the break. You're watching CNBC Africa coming to you live from the World Economic Forum on Africa in Cape Town. Stay with us. We'll be back after the short break. Great. You can all breathe for two minutes. Thanks for holding your breath for such a long time. to all the guests again. Phil, all the guests again. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to introduce you all again to camera. All right. Welcome back to the World Economic Forum on Africa. We're still focusing on agriculture, investing in transformation. And I have Akin Adesina, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Nigeria. Philip Kiriro, the President and Chairman of the Eastern African Farmers Federation, Kenya. Jane Karuku, President, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, that's AGRA, Michael Mack, the CEO of Syngenta International, and James Mwangi, Group CEO, Equity Bank, Kenya. James, I just want to stay with this financial discussion for a little longer. Are bankers becoming innovative when it comes to insurance projects, or insurance products rather, for farmers? Uh, it is true, banks are becoming innovative in managing leaks, but uh, basically what uh, the banks are doing are to pool partners 
who can provide financial services. Banks are not really underwriting the insurance policies, but they are saying, can we pool, create an ecosystem? Can we create a complete value chain where to disaggregate the risk and get the specialist to underwrite that risk? So I, I, I see that, for instance, livestock insurance is now in the market, crop insurance, weather insurance, and this, these are now becoming helpful tools that banks are using uh, to cover the weather risks. Michael, you are present in 90 countries. You employ 27,000 people across the globe. One of your key focuses is crop protection. Can I put the bad word in there, pesticides? How is Africa receiving the crop protection game? Well, today, Africa, I mentioned it a bit ago that the productivity here in Africa is not very high. Uh, in part, they don't have, because they don't have great access to markets, they're not using the most modern uh, tools available to them. And uh, let's face it, if you have uh, basic fertilizer, if you've got the money to be able to use a good seed in the ground, then it is critical for you to protect that investment, because those are the front end investments. And Mother Nature wants to have a go at the farm, as you know, whether it's an insect or weeds or a disease from a fungus. Uh, if these things aren't protected, the farmer is going to lose 100% uh, of their crop. So it's a necessary and important tool to agriculture. Always but, you, has been. but you've battled with, with pesticides traditionally. There was a, a revolution against using pesticides generally. Can you, you take me through how that perception is perhaps changing? Because you, you're right, you need to protect against the unforeseen, and well, in look, this instance, often disease. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the very first uh, incidents of pesticides have already been discovered 5,000 BC. So farmers have been battling pests who've been competing with their crops for a very long time. I appreciate that in, uh, that in less enlightened parts of the world, as people move away from the farm and move into the cities, they want to make romantic the idea that, uh, being, that farming is easy and that, uh, that it's something that they can do without tools. People who live in farming communities and in rural communities understand very well that these are essential tools and each and every year, the new products that come out are better than the ones that preceded them. Jen, how are you working with the G8 and their initiative for agriculture, specifically open data, which I know has recently been tabled. It's actually where I picked up the iCow information out of Kenya. Okay. I think we are working with them to develop data because one of the things that lacks in Africa, unlike in other continents, is data. Data to support the farmers, even in terms of how much rain are we going to expect, what's the price of commodities, what's a better pesticide to use so that I don't destroy my environment, what's a better seed in terms of ecological zones. And we are struggling with this data even in terms of what are the practices that have, will lead us to have a great impact in terms of solving our problems. So we are working on G with G8 in terms of trying to build pool data because nobody has it right now and we are working to create it. Are the East African Farmers Federation starting to access that data as well from the G8? Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, to a limited extent. I, I think we need to actually do more around it than... Uh, and it is right now. Because when it actually comes to, to, to protection of, uh, of crops out there, I think there's more to it in, in, in small-scale agriculture than just protecting the crop. Because we, we actually happen to be, to be the immediate consumers of what we grow. And it's actually very important that uh, around the use and application of uh, pesticides, the, the small-scale farmers are actually properly trained and informed so that uh, we actually have a culture that, that protects not only us as consumers, but those who actually come to the markets in the, in, in the rural areas. The other issue I would like to capture just quickly is the issue of financing agriculture. Because I think for, for us, it's actually, it is farmers that have actually been pushing for agricultural banks. There are even commodities that have actually gone to an extent of saying, hey, let's have a coffee farmer's uh, bank. But, but, but I think that was actually out of problems that uh, a lot of us actually had. Because there were times when commercial banks had not gone rural. And I would like to thank Equity and other banks from Kenya that have actually gone to the rural areas. So we did not actually have a CV to present to the banks to be able to access the facilities. Two, with the growth in trade and getting a small producers actually producing along specific value chains like small dairy, we are actually able to, to have a common bond where we actually paid through banks and that provides the bank with information on individual farmers. 
And then the issue of insurance. I would like to say that the South African Farmer Federation was actually involved in a program with Comesa, the common market for East and uh, South Africa, in trying to actually market, you know, weather index insurance. And I think this is exactly how we need governments, because what is actually lacking out there is actually credible weather stations that can be relied on. And I think it is only the public sector, it's only governments that can actually be able to do that. And then beyond that, when it comes to, when it comes to issues of lending, and getting the banks actually working with us. I have personally been involved in a dialogue of a group of stakeholders that is working around getting the banks, getting finances work for agriculture, where we have the central bank governors, we have the commercial banks. And the issue of risks keep coming. And we need, we need governments in this. And I'm glad the governors of central bank are actually picking it because we need to actually address issues of risks. Minister Adesina, I want to come back to Grow Africa, an informal alliance formed two years ago at the World Economic Forum in Cape Town. You are the latest member of Grow Africa, and as I said, I was listening to the session earlier today. Do you think that this organization is gaining momentum? It's going to have traction in forcing the agricultural agenda? No, absolutely. You know, as I said in the beginning, for far too long, we've looked at agriculture as a development activity. And now we're looking at agriculture as a business. And so what Grow Africa actually does is to facilitate linkages between agribusinesses uh, and countries. Uh, take the case of Nigeria, my country, for example. One of the fundamental things we did was that we said we were going to take investment focus. We're going to be very much focused on value chains in which we have comparative advantage. And that we're going to work with the private sector. In the last one year that we've actually launched our agricultural transformation agenda, we have attracted $8 billion worth of investment commitments for the private sector. And some of them are here, as the flour mills of Nigeria here, Dan Gotek, uh, Cargill, Unilever, and others that are investing in Nigeria. And that's because of the fundamental policy shift that, 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 that we made. Um, and I think this is very important, even coming back to the issue of the insurance thing. You know, if farmers don't have market, if there are no agribusinesses that will buy from them, process what they have, why will they invest in insurance? Why will they take credit? And so I think it's important to link smallholder farmers to off-takers, the agribusinesses that can actually buy and process what they do. Uh, Philip raised the issue about the role of public policy when it comes to insurance products. We know whether index insurance works. The fundamental issue with it, though, is is it affordable to smallholder farmers? And I think this is where the public sector has to come in and subsidize the cost of the premiums for this weather index insurance products to be able to go to scale. And secondly, and most fundamentally, is that we need to also make sure that when we structure these partnerships with the private sector insurance markets, that we liberalize that market. In Nigeria, for example, we have Nigerian Agricultural Insurance Company. It's a monopoly trying to do uh, 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 agricultural insurance. We've taken that decision that we are going to liberalize that we're going to get all that insurance company into the mix, let them develop better products, the premiums are going to go down, and therefore farmers are going to be able to uh, afford it. But I think in everything we do in Africa, we must not abandon the farmers. For way too long, we ask the questions why farmers are poor in Africa. And I think that's because we just simply, you know, it's almost like you go to Olympics, you have no shoes, and you're trying to run with Hussein Bolt. I mean, you, you've got to support farmers with institutions, with finance, with credit, with things to mitigate their risks and connect them to, far, uh, to markets. And, and I think the time for that is now, and I think Grow Africa provides an excellent platform for doing that. You make an excellent point. You've got to connect farmers with access to finance, to credit, and you've also got to provide them with access to infrastructure. You can't have a discussion on enabling farmers across rural Africa without understanding the, the plight and the need for infrastructure. Jane, can I get you to comment there? Yes, I think in many parts of Africa, we see a lot of productivity, like now when it's raining, a lot of produce. But the post-harvest losses could go up to 30, 60%, depending on the location. I think the estimates right now is that we are wasting about $4 billion worth of produce. Simply because the farmers can't get it Just to market? Just simply because there is no infrastructure to get from where it is a lot to where that doesn't exist where the market is. Or they can't store it. Or they, they also can't store it because we are very poor also in terms of even cottage value addition processes or technologies, which is another way which probably can, it can be a double-edged sort of a solution to give us, to attract youth into agriculture 
because the value addition will have more money and it's less tedious than the guy in the hall the whole day. Michael, can we see here private sector making a dent at providing infrastructure, specifically private sector players like yourself? You are the, the largest spender on research and development, one of the largest spenders on research and development in the agricultural space globally. Can not some of that spend go to infrastructure? Well, I mean, look, we're not in the business of building roads and bridges. Uh, I'll make that clear. That's not a, a deep research and development uh, uh, school. But uh, what we are able to do, because many crops, of course, are short season crops between the time they plant and the time they harvest, some six months or so of, uh, of time goes by, uh, Syngenta routinely is responsible for providing the working capital for farmers by giving them uh, credit terms through our distributors and dealers. So a big part of a farmer's risk profile is that upfront investment in uh, putting the inputs into their crop and the technology providers are the ones largely that finance that. It's a big, uh, a big load off the road. You bring us back to finance. I'm coming back mm -hmm. to infrastructure. Minister Addison, I want you to add, but James, just coming back to education. Long-term finance, short-term finance, working capital, do the farmers on the ground have these skills and how are you helping to empower them in terms of financial literacy? Thank you. It is true. If once we complete the value chains and ecosystem, I think we need still to invest a lot on the farmer because essentially uh, infrastructure and value chains will not increase productivity on the farmer. It's the farmer uh, themselves that needs to increase the yield, the productivity, based on the use of knowledge. Uh, let's say satisfied seeds, fertilizers, right chemicals, right application, farming at the right time. And that, I think, is where huge investments from public resources needs to go. Well, I think uh, we can say that uh, currently the African farmer at, at the small scale level is not globally competitive because the knowledge has not been really institutionalized. So we need to invest a lot in that area. Michael, take it. In, in, by the way, in traditional agriculture, the governments were deeply involved in extension services, uh, as James was just saying. I think increasingly with technology, I mean, think, uh, think iPad, uh, think mobile phone, the ability to, to uh, confer a lot of this knowledge in microclimates uh, throughout the world is going to, the cost of that is going to go down substantially, and the rate of knowledge acquisition by growers is going to go up exponentially. Philip, you want to add? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I would like to raise one issue because, uh, as, as Monty has actually put it, already the banks are actually working a lot with the farmers. As I said, most of our commercial banks are actually now in the rural areas, and we've actually formed a bulk of, the, of, of their clients. But, but we still see we still see uh, a, a, missing, a missing link when it comes to the way the banks work with the farmers, and especially the small-scale farmers. Because you know, a bank is an institution that is professional in nature and has got procedures. And our feeling that we still need to connect the bankers with the farm organizations. I would like to see a situation where the East African Farmers Federation is actually working with Mwangi, and for him to actually develop confidence in our institutions. Because we are not movements. We are professional farm organizations with technical people in our secretariat. For example, the East African Farmer Federation has actually got uh, a trade program officer, highly qualified. Philip, I'm going to ask you to keep your mic to this. Keep looking yeah. at me. So, I'm so going to so James in a moment. So, so what we are saying is that uh, for small-scale farmers, I, I think we need to connect with the banks so that we can actually be able to ensure that uh, we operate in a manner that, uh, you know, small farmers are actually operating also through their institutions. Because as individuals, they're actually quite vulnerable. And if, uh, we need to actually work on that. James, if I right jump to in it there, then what we really need to do is then to pro, uh, formalize agribusinesses. Because essentially what you are doing is that you are confronting an, uh, an informalized sector with the formal players. Banks come here, very formalized, and uh, agribusiness has not been really formalized. And that's why I said capacity needs to be built so that uh, it's two partners who Organized agriculture exactly. is stronger. Yeah. Minister Adesina, let's get your input yeah, here. I want to talk about uh, infrastructure because, um, you know, you take, for example, tomatoes in Nigeria. We have a vast valley in Kano which produces over 65% of the tomatoes and it rots away every day because, you know, there is no processing capacity there. Um, you take a look at Nigeria in terms of the production of pineapples. We are the number one producer of pineapples in Africa, but we, it, it rots away, we don't have it. So what we've decided to do is that it's not the role of the private sector to invest in power, water, and roads. 
If the, if the private sector is investing in power, water, and roads for them to put their food manufacturing plants there, that's an indication of market failure and, and government failure. And so what we've decided to do in Nigeria is to create these things we call staple crop processing zones. Essentially what they are, are like your export processing zones. So the food manufacturing industry, I mean, companies have been attracted to areas of high food production. And when they come there, we automatically we upgrade power, water, and roads for them. So these stable crop processing zones, we are providing them with fiscal incentives. We are providing them with infrastructure incentives. I take the case of cassava, for which Nigeria is the largest producer in the world. And I want Nigeria to be the largest processor of it in the world. And we are working today with Cargill flour mills of Nigeria uh, and all the Coca-Cola off-takers to process that cassava into starch, from starch into sweetness, and even from starch also into sorbitol. But for those guys to come into those areas, we have to provide the infrastructure. So I think this is a, 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 an opportunity for uh, banks, financial institutions, multilateral development banks to put money into infrastructure. In Nigeria, World Bank, Africa Development Bank, USAID, DFID, are supporting investment in infrastructure. And I think that's going to be very key for us if we are going to attract the private sector to go in there and process and add value to what we produce. Minister Addison, you remind me of Davos where you said that President Goodluck Jonathan was so good looking because he He's eats still cassava very good bread. <laughs> cassava bread. We come back to that. Anyway, I've got a question here on uh, Twitter and it is, what about land ownership? It remains a challenge on the continent. Who would like to, to field this? I can take that. You know, the, the issue of land ownership, I think we need to look at it from a gender perspective. I think there is an issue of women not having access to land, and I think that we have to sort out. Inheritance laws are very biased against women in Africa, and we have to make sure that you have access to land. Otherwise, as we raise productivity, you're going to have a lot of inequality and inequity in the system. Second is for the private sector that comes into a country, they want to have access to land. They need to have a one-stop shop that can help them in negotiating access to land with governments and with communities. I'll give an example. In Nigeria, we attracted a company called Dominion Farms uh, to invest $40 million uh, in rice production in Nigeria. We had to negotiate uh, land for them uh, with the government, and they were able to get all the land that they needed. Today, we are working with flour mills of Nigeria, with Cargill in Kogi State of Nigeria. We are negotiating access to land for them. I just want to be clear. The problem for us in Nigeria is not land. What I will not be for is land grab in a situation where big companies just come to make actually money off the capitalized value of land. But we must make sure that when private companies come into our areas, that there's value for the community, that smallholder farmers are not disempowered. And most importantly, that women participate and benefit in a lot of the shared benefits. Philip, how are East African farmers dealing with the, the situation of land and access to land property rights? Yeah, as East African Farmers Federation, we have actually been able to dialogue and discuss the issue of land. We, have, we actually have a position of land, on land, and we have actually made it very clear that uh, we need to actually sort out the issue of land as, 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 as a major issue. Because without, without security of tenure, especially among the small-scale farmers, it is not going to be possible. We have actually conducted many studies, and it is actually clear that uh, in our own regions, it is actually less than 10% of the smallholders that have got legal deeds. And you keep wondering exactly why they cannot actually increase productivity, why they cannot actually be able to take care of their, of their soils and the environment. It's because of lack of ownership. So we have actually made it very clear. And there is actually data indicating that if you get to the small-scale farmers, there is a positive correlation between poverty and land ownership. The reason why in Kenya the small-scale agriculture is, is so dynamic is because some of the regions have legal deeds on land. So for us, land is actually critical, and we actually need to actually sort it out. So that when an investor comes to Kenya, to Uganda, to Tanzania, I connect with an investor on business-to-business -business basis. And I think for us, that's actually very important, so that we can actually be able to move agriculture forward. At this point, uh, I'd like to also open to the audience for any questions, if you can adhere to the following protocol. Uh, if you could take stand, please state your name, the organization you're from, and then pose the appropriate question to the select panelist. Uh, we have roving mics that we will deploy to the audience. I've got a question here. If I could get a mic to this gentleman while we're doing that, a quick one to you, Jane, from Twitter, and that is female farmers. Minister Adesina mentioned them a moment earlier. There's got to be 
some special support for female farmers out there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, we say that smallholder, 80% of the food we eat in Africa is by smallholder farmers. Of the 80%, another 80% is women. It's only in Africa where women have land issues or ownership issues, I think. So the issue of access to finance from a collateral perspective doesn't work. Uh, I think last night to, somebody told us that men eat first, they eat a lot, and they take all the money after the hard work. So we need to make sure that we address the specific women issues in terms of being innovative, even from a financial sector perspective, because we know this is a group of people that do not default. We know they work very hard. But how do we make it, how do we make the situation and environment such that they get what is worth their hard labor? And that requires a lot of government interventions in terms of legislation. And I guess for people who are in technology transfer, in NGO, in development, in commercial sector like banks to treat women differently. So, question? Yeah. It's fine, you can just hold it. It's on. Hello. My name is Dr. Chris Kirubi from Kenya. First, I want to say thank you for all these nice guys here. But I like to classify farming as modern slavery that continues in Africa because people labor for so little, if at all anything. And two, we know access of prod processed African products to the Western world, America in the lot, is almost impossible. And also, even fresh products. You have to buy so many chemicals from the developed countries in order to comply with their changing rules of the game. And the chemical producers make more money than the farmer exporting the products to their countries. Next year, we'll be here talking again about the same thing. I like to tell my friend at the Sina, I admire him. But if we cannot sort out the market access and fair play, we will talk until cows come home. Thank you. Thanks very much. Market access, I know it is a key drive for you, Minister Adesina. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think market access has to be looked at, Chris, in, in two ways. Uh, one is the domestic market. You know, we have a huge population in Africa, but we've been using that population to buy imported food. And I think as we do that, we actually are exporting jobs into all those countries, the developed countries that you're mentioning, without actually creating jobs at home. So we actually have to grow the size of the domestic market. If you take staple crops today in Africa, the size of that staple crop market is $55 billion. We have to create wider regional markets for ourselves to be able to actually export to ourselves instead of actually looking out. Secondly, is that we must process and add value to all the staple crops that we have. You know, for example, if you have tomatoes, if you have uh, pineapples, if you have cassava, we are going to add value to that. And as you do that, you actually create local market. I mean, you mentioned right now my favorite issue, which has to do with cassava bread. You know, in Nigeria, when we decided we were going to process cassava to high quality cassava flour to replace a lot of the wheat that we are currently importing, there's a reason for it, is that when we do that, we create markets locally, we actually increase the incomes of farmers, and we save ourselves close to $1.5 billion in doing that. So I think we must look not just at markets outside, we must look at markets inside and create those markets by adding value to what we also produce. Minister Asiyan, to go to the floor, you sir, and then you ma'am are up next. Thank you. My name is uh, Hussam Mahmoud. I'm the CEO of Al Dahra Agricultural Company. Where we are focused on the security food program of UAE. And uh, we are present in 12 countries today where we do farming, processing, storage for our crops, logistics, and also the trading. Uh, we do believe that uh, Africa, and especially, uh, especially West Africa, uh, sorry, East Africa, uh, can be a very good partner for our program by supplying these crops to Middle East countries because of the proximity and the, the land. But in order to do this, we need a huge uh, lots, uh, plots of lands, 
and to uh, bring all our technologies and uh, infrastructure in these countries. And how can we do this? Thank you very much. Could we get the mic to this lady in the front, please? Thank you. An answer on that front? Philip, would you like to take it? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I, I would like to first and foremost uh, say that uh, uh, we farmers of East Africa are not uh, anti you know, foreign and direct investment. But uh, we have a feeling that uh, uh, we need to turn it around. Because for us, it's actually supposed to be an opportunity. And we need to actually produce for those markets. And that's why we are telling our governments that uh, instead of actually giving away land, why don't you actually invest in us so that we can actually take advantage of, of your markets? I think uh, where investors can actually come in well in, in that particular process is around areas where we need capacity in, in processing. Because some of the products that we actually need to sell to your markets will require, you know, you know, processing so that they can actually stay longer. And I think we can actually be able to partner. But it's still uh, in, in, in the region, uh, we have actually seen situation where, you know, there is actually partnership between farmer and, and, and foreign investors. And there is space, especially among us, our large-scale farmers. We've got land, it's not very productive for now, and they need uh, ventures. And I think there is actually that space. But for the small-scale farmers, we don't want to turn the attention of governments, getting the governments to actually address issues of food security using investments. For purposes of sovereignty, we need to actually see governments invest in us so that we can actually be able to do Philip, business with thanks you. Thanks so much. A quick one, Minister Adesina. We're almost out of time. I'll take questions after the broadcast from the, the rest of our no, audience. No, I think just to say that, you know, the, the way for Africa is to have structured purchase agreements like that with countries, and then we can have farmers to meet that because the most important thing for you is that you have the right volume of, of produce supply and time and cost effectively for you. And so it's got to be a partnership that win, win, wins. It's, it's a double win partnership. But Africa should not be afraid of growth. We shouldn't be afraid of markets. We should structure ourselves to take advantage of those markets in a way that works for millions and millions uh, of our farmers. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this discussion on investing in transformation in agriculture across the African continent. It's clear that we need to search in the need or the search for food security and poverty alleviation. We need multi-stakeholder engagement. Thank you so much to my esteemed panelists. From me, Bronwyn Nielsen, thank you very much for watching. Until next time. Thank you very much. We do have some more time in terms of the scheduled session, so can I take your question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm, my name if is If you could Rose. stand, please. Thank you. Yes, I thought my shortness was probably going to give me trouble. Um, my name is Rose, Rose Phillips. I'm from Accenture, and um, we're, we're with a management consulting company that have decided to heavily invest in Africa over many years, and I do recognize that investment requires transformation because transformation makes sure that we don't leave people marginalized. And my major concern is as we commercialize, as we talk about creating business in agriculture, we do have the potential of leaving behind the marginalized. So we're talking about poverty alleviation, but I do worry that as we become commercial, as we turn from subsistence into business, we are going to, in a sense, make poverty worse because those people that are living on subsistence farming, that sending their children to school based on their farming capability, are going to lose that. And, and I, I worry that we talk a lot about the commercialization and not enough about the sustainability and the growth for all of our people on the continent. That's my first comment. And then the second one is I really just want us to talk about water because I think water, as we all know, is a very scarce resource and will be more and more scarce. And I haven't heard us really address the issue of water. So those are my two comments and questions to the panel. Thank you very much. The issue of water. Jane. Yeah, I think maybe we misunderstood each other, but the commercialization is actually seeing an existing subsistence farmer, seeing him or herself as a business, so instead of being a slave, like Chris puts it, starts earning a bit more for their hard labor. So it's not displacing those people, it's improving the productivity of those people so they can make better their lives. 
I think in terms of, uh, I think we didn't talk about it, but it's sustainability is, uh, was implied when I was talking about end to end de-risking the whole chain. So you're not de-risking just for today, you're also de-risking for future. So if you talk about agronomy or what pesticides you use or what, whether you're using irrigation or you're using rain fed, you have to do it in a way that you protect the environment and the world for generations to come. Can so I we make, didn't call it out, but it is implied there. Yeah. Can I make a comment on, yeah. the, on your question or concern uh, about the subsistence farmer? You know, I've been in agriculture for close to 25, 26 years. I have never met a single subsistence farmer, and I'll explain myself. You know, nobody chooses to be a subsistence farmer. The only farmers that I've met are smallholder farmers that are constrained by lack of access to land, lack of access to capital, lack of access to extension, information, and you know, market access, all that. That is what constrains them to be where they are. So what we are actually talking about is when you have agribusinesses that are setting up, for example, a start processing plant, they are going to be structured in such a way that they have ad growers, those farmers are producing for them. So that increases market access and actually stabilizes prices for them. My view is that agriculture in, in this continent for so long has taken that perspective of poverty reduction. I think it's, a, it's not a, a right lens. We must begin to look at it from a lens of creating wealth. And when you create wealth, you do that via markets and you structure institutions and arrangements that make sure that the smallholder par farmers participate, engage, and benefit from that. So let's forget all about the poverty reduction thing. It doesn't work. It is all about wealth creation. And if you are going to create wealth, you really absolutely must have markets, but actually have fair markets that can create robust Thank growth. Thank you, Minister yeah. Adesina. And I've been told we have to end. So just very quickly, one comment from you, I'll, Michael. I'll say this about water. Agriculture uses way too much water, and there are plenty of agronomic practices and tools to be able to diminish that by a great deal, and we need to get on with it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for being a black audience.